Chapter 24, Al. It took only a few hours to construct my little library. While I worked, Miss Scoggin acted as my lookout and the deer cat was her assistant. As, they, as the sky grew light, Miss Scoggin began to sigh and ask about breakfast, but I was very firm that breakfast would be afterward and she was a good lookout. Twice she whistled and I had just enough time to hide behind some bushes leaving my work in a pile while someone passed along Main Street. Luckily, it was still too dim for most people to notice a pile of boards and books on the town green, and no one came to investigate. My project turned out well. Even Miss Scoggin approved. I do miss our library, though. She had a sad look. I miss it, too, I told her, very much. A library is a place for you, she said as we walked toward home. A nice, big one. And leave Martinville? Who would take care of you and Miss, Mr. Brock? Mr. Brock and I will do just fine, she said, just as soon as you take your place in the world. Perhaps this is a start, she smiled at me. I waited for a reminder or criticism, but she continued to smile. We had climbed up to our porch where I dropped my saw, my hammer, and my extra nails. Thank you for your help, I told her, and I extended a fist to the dear cat, who rubbed his cheek against my knuckles. I held the front door open for him. Miss Scoggin had no use for doors, of course, but the deer cat would not come inside. Not, sorry, nor did he settle himself on a swing. The deer cat, who had never before ventured out alone beyond the top step of our porch, was now trotting down the stairs and marching off, tail up, back toward the town green. Cat, Miss Scoggin cried out, cat! but he did not even turn around. He'll be back soon, I said, but to be honest, I was shaken. I'll start getting breakfast ready, I said. Isn't it Monday? Miss Scoggin began to count on her fingers. Mondays were the day I visited Grantville to renew Mr. Brock's book, buy our few necessities and practice my invisibility, but I felt worn out. I watched her count and hoped she would not do it correctly. It is Monday, she announced triumphantly. You will do your errands, and I will fetch breakfast for Mr. Brock and myself. You? In the kitchen? Go upstairs to change, she said, waving me toward the stairs, and then you may take the last apple muffin to eat along the way. She had a very generous look on her face, and so I thanked her, although, of course, I had made the muffins myself. Chapter 25, Mortimer. Mortimer's fourth day as guardian of the library was momentous. Early in the morning, the boy with a question mark face appeared with his very loud friend. As things turned out, Mortimer's help was needed. The boy with a question mark face got himself quickly turned around in the high bushes near Mortimer's beloved lost library, and then had trouble seeing the only thing there, there of any particular interest. Mortimer stood upon it, until the boy finally noticed. Thanks, the boy had said. You are welcome, Mortimer said. In truth, he was feeling quite overwhelmed by memories of Petunia. There was no library anymore, but Mortimer had been standing exactly where the old blue doors had once been. And those blue doors would always remind him of his fierce sister Petunia because of the time she got stuck on top of them. He could almost hear her voice. Chase me, Mortimer, chase me. All your fault, his heart said. And then Mrs. Ann Baker, whom Mortimer knew well, brought her daughter to the little free library. A small suitcase swung from Mrs. Baker's hand. Her daughter held her other hand, although she could mostly walk by herself now. Hello, friend, Mrs. Baker said to Mortimer. I heard you were the guardian of our new library. I brought you something. She held out a kitty treat. She often brought him a few when she led tours at the history house. Thank you, Mortimer said. You're welcome, she said. Mrs. Baker always seemed to know what Mortimer was saying. He liked that. Book, Mrs. Baker's daughter said. She dropped her mother's hand and pointed with both hands. One aimed at the red wagon full of books. The other one at Mr. Gregorian's egg crate. 
Yes, sweetie, books. Book, the girl repeated, now pointing at Mortimer. Mrs. Baker laughed. That's a cat. Meow. From the small suitcase, which she had opened on the grass, Mrs. Baker removed a folded blanket. She shook it out, and they settled on it. Mrs. Baker, her daughter, and Mortimer. That's when Mortimer saw what else was in the suitcase. More books. Everything was nicely arranged, with the small book spines all facing up. And inside the top of the suitcase, the word poetry had been painted in big letters and surrounded by several small paint handprints. Paint, the little girl said, pointing. Paint more, Mommy. Our paints are at home, honey. Let's read now. Read book? Book, the girl confirmed. Meow. Mrs. Baker removed one of the books from the case and opened it. Here's a poem I love, she said. This poem is called April Rain Song by Mr. Langston Hughes. He was a teenager when he wrote it. She cleared her throat and began. Let the rain kiss you. Rain kiss, Mortimer thought. That reminded him of wind tickle. Let the rain beat upon your head with silver liquid drops. Silver liquid, his heart said. Yes, exactly. Mortimer closed his eyes so he could better listen. When the poem was over, he opened them. Something inside him had changed. Listening to poetry, Mortimer's heart said, feels like looking in a mirror. Maybe he was good with words in his own way. He wished he could tell Petunia. Whoops, Mrs. Baker said. Mortimer looked up and saw clouds heavy and low. He felt a few drops of rain. Mrs. Baker Baker closed the book and carefully pushed the suitcase along the grass until it was tucked safely under the umbrella. They all scooched until they were underneath too. Together they watched the rainfall, silver liquid drops. But Mortimer felt unaccountably tired. He knew he was old, but he had hardly ever felt old. Now he did. If Petunia is anywhere, he told himself, she must be old too which seemed impossible. Mrs. Baker left the suitcase, which became the library's fourth room. Chapter 26, Evan. Friday morning, Evan's parents made him a special graduation breakfast, French toast with bananas. His mom squeezed fresh orange juice and his dad cooked the bananas with sugar in a pan making them sweet and crunchy. When they were sitting at the table, his parents looked pretty happy. His mom had actually taken her headset off and his dad was laughing. Maybe Evan thought he should stop trying to solve a mystery that probably didn't exist. He tried not to wonder about H.G. Higgins. He tried to worry about nothing other than keeping his button-down shirt clean for graduation that afternoon. He was stuffing books into his backpack near the back door when his mom asked, have you been back to the little free library of? I drove by yesterday. People sure seemed to love it. Evan hadn't been back. He could see it across the street and on his way, on his way to school though. It was definitely growing. His dad said, I'd like to see it too, maybe after graduation. It's weird they never rebuilt the real library, Evan said. Why didn't they? His mom cleared her throat. Well, when the library burned down, it was really pain. It was a really painful time for the town. Dad, I mean, you lived here. His mother had grown up in California. She and his dad had met in college. Didn't anyone want to rebuild it? His dad was staring at the table. He said, if anyone did think about rebuilding, I'd be the last person in town they would talk to about it. The kitchen felt quieter than it had ever been. Even the refrigerator seemed to hold its breath. Evan said, why? But his dad just smiled. I don't know why I said that, Evan. I guess I didn't get much sleep. The school librarian said you used to work at the library when you were in high school. Were you working there when it burned down? Did you know those people who died? His dad looked at the floor. I have so many emails to answer, Evan. I can't have this conversation right now. I'll see you at graduation. Yes, the picnic, his mom said fiddling with the headphones that had hung around her neck. Dad's making a pie. She was nervous, Evan realized. You guys, Evan said. You can't just not tell me anything. His parents studied him. 
The way they were looking at him made Evan feel, for those few seconds, like he could see himself through their eyes. He stood tall and looked right back at them. Then his dad looked up and said, you're right, Evan. How about after the picnic, you and I talk. We can walk home together. Evan hesitated. This afternoon, you won't back out? No chance. It's a plan. So get yourself on the road and let me do my work and start up this pie. Evan glanced at his mom, who was smiling across the kitchen at his dad. His dad would explain it all today. Why hadn't he just asked him before? He left the house feeling closer than ever to solving his problem, not even a mystery. The day felt long, even for a half day. Evan mostly looked around their classroom and felt weird that they were never coming back to it. He couldn't even eat his lunch, but he wasn't sure if it was because he was excited about graduation, nervous about talking to his dad later, or sad about leaving Martinville Elementary. Through the cafeteria windows, he started to hear cars pull up. The families were coming. Mr. O'Neill excused himself and everyone knew why. Every year, he bought a new bow tie for graduation and he always put it on right before the ceremony started. The ties were usually colorful. What do you think it'll be? Evan asked Rafe, who was eating Evan's sandwich. Polka dots? Rainbow stripes? Rafe chewed. Baseballs, maybe. Baseballs? Then Mr. O'Neill reappeared, wearing a bow tie with little books on it. Some of the kids clapped. In honor of our new little free library, he said, patting his tie. This is it. Graduation time. Let's line up. The other fifth grade teacher, Mr. Miss Brennan, called out, Let's move, people! And her class jumped up and mobbed the door. Mr. O'Neill rolled his eyes. Chairs had been set up on the lawn outside, and it was sunny out, with what Evan's mom liked to call a perfect breeze. While they marched down to their seats near the front, kids waved to their parents and pointed at the rows of desserts waiting on the long table near the podium. Evan found his parents and waved, then he caught up with Rafe in line so they could sit together. Each year, the fifth grade teachers picked poems to read at graduation. This year, it was Mr. O'Neill's turn to read first. This year's graduating class is an especially lovely and deep group of students, he said, unfolding a piece of paper. So I picked an especially deep and lovely poem called The Summer Day, and it was written by the American poet, Mary Oliver. He cleared his throat and began. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't, I don't know exactly who, what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mr. O'Neill looked up from his paper, smiled, and blew them all a kiss. Wow, Rafe said. Evan turned around in his chair to look at his parents. His dad was wiping his eyes. He saw his mom lean over to kiss him on the cheek. Then Miss Brennan was marching up to the podium. She grabbed it with both hands and leaned forward. Life is like riding a bicycle, she shouted. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Albert Einstein said that. She turned around and walked back to her seat. Then the fifth graders stood up to get their diplomas one by one. Mr. O'Neill stood off to the side and shook hands with every kid in their class. When it was Evan's turn, he said, keep looking for life's mysteries, kid. And that was it. Everyone turned their attention to the dessert table. There were 60 different kinds of cakes, pies, brownies, and cookies. Correction, 59. Rafe's parents had brought a bag of mixed nuts because they worried about sugar. Plus, they said, Rafe had that dentist appointment right after the picnic. Do they remember about the expiration? Evan asked Rafe. They were on a blanket eating five kinds of cookies, and this was only round one. Rafe shook his head. I have a feeling they forgot all about it, but it's probably better that way. 
Yeah, they look nice and relaxed. Squinting, Evan had picked out Rafe's parents in the crowd standing around the long dessert table. Your parents only moved here 10 years ago, and they're talking to everyone. Look at my dad alone over there, and he was born here. Evan's dad was, as usual, standing a little bit apart from everyone else. Rafe said, he's just shy, maybe. He shoved a whole cookie in his mouth. Half an hour later, Evan walked around picking up stray napkins and feeling antsy to leave. He was uncomfortably full of dessert, but worse, his dad had promised, promised to tell him something on the way home. And then, when everyone had started gathering up their blankets and packing up their half-eaten pies, his dad had totally backed out. I'm so sorry, Evan. Dad, you promised. Looking upset, his father was already moving toward the parking lot. I just, I can't right now, but we'll talk about it soon, I promise. Evan stared after him. After him, What just happened? A minute ago, he looked like he was actually having fun for once, laughing with Mr. O'Neill. And then, when it was finally time to walk home together, he ran away. Evan was done with waiting. It was time to put his detective cap on again but he didn't draw his thumb down his forehead. Too many people around. Evan kicked a napkin. Then, feeling bad, he bent down and picked it up. His mom came up behind him and put an arm around his shoulders. Your dad just needs a little more time. Walk me home. I'll buy you a piece of pie. Not funny and I can't go home yet. I have something to do. Okay, but be home for dinner. His mom raised the basket in her hand. We're having pie.